What I'm going to do is I'm not going to over, I hope I'm not going to overwhelm you with science. I'm going to try and overwhelm you with ideas and there'll be a little bit of science along the way, but we have lots of courses that are on the science, so you don't need to, to hear a lot about that. The, some of you may have heard of uh, Fraser Mustard, who just passed away a couple of weeks ago. So the talk is uh, influenced strongly by him, and he, we were very close friends, and he kept telling me, Brian, you've got to have, you've got to have Cuba in these talks. You've got to have Cuba in these talks. People won't get it. So there'll be some Cuba, too, and you'll see why. You can see the key point here. Uh, we live in a society exquisitely dependent upon brain development in which hardly anyone knows anything about the brain or its development. You'll recognize that I've paraphrased this. But in fact, we could, we could say we live in an educational situation dependent upon brain development in which hardly anyone knows anything about the brain or brain development. So my message here is really to try and show you why brain development is critical to education and understanding the principles that govern it are clearly uh, central to education. One of the things that we have to recognize is that environment plays an important role in all phenotypes. And the term uh, phenotypic plasticity was uh, coined by these guys, Gilbert and Eppel. Let me give you an example here. So what you've got is a bunch of creatures. And it doesn't matter what they are. I wouldn't know what. This is a fish, obviously. But these are some sort of uh, marine creatures. And notice that they're fairly simple. Here's the same creatures down here when subject to predation. So what happens? These are adult animals that can change their phenotype if they're undergoing predation. So just take this guy. He grows all these spiky things, which he doesn't have here. This is uh, uh, expensive in terms of building the resources. So the idea here is that midstream, your phenotype can be, can be changed by the environment, the idea of phenotypic diversity. Well, the brain and the nervous system in general uh, is probably even more responsive to environmental input. And I'm going to tell you that it's responsive to environmental input preconceptually, before you're conceived. So obviously things that happen to your mom and dad, and prenatally uh, when you're in utero, and then all the way through to this moment. The impact, uh, the impact of the environment, unfortunately, for people with gray hair, like Brian and me, is going down. But uh, it's still there. OK. Epigenetics. You may or may not have heard the term epigenetics. Epigenetics is probably uh, the most revolutionary idea in science, in biological science, uh, in 50 years. And it's going to be more and more important, and you'll see as we go along why. Here's the deal. You have cells that make up your toenails, cells that make up your brain, cells that make up your bones, your eyes. They all have the same DNA but they're not the same. The cells are different. Within the brain, there are dozens of kinds of neurons. Again, they all have the same DNA, but they're different. So the question is, why is that? And the answer is that genes are turned on or they're turned off. So I'm going to give you a metaphor. You think this is a watch, so do I. I can look at it and I can tell the time. I've still got a watch on, but I can't tell the time because something's in the way. So the, the same idea applies to genes. The, this is now a gene. The gene can either be available to produce things or it can be turned off. So at any given time, most of your genes in, in different cells are turned off. Okay, and so we have ways of doing that. It turns out that experiences that you have determine which genes are on or off. So what I'm going to show you is that during development, Experiences will turn genes on in your brain or off in your brain, and that's going to produce a different brain and a different set of uh, behaviors as a result. This is uh, a chromosome. This is just a, a cartoon, obviously. A chromosome. These are the genes here, and the genes are wrapped around these things called histones. And it turns out that these little tails here can actually turn the genes. They act like my hand on the watch. There's another thing up there, those methyl groups, same thing. So there's more than one way to do this. It doesn't really matter for our purposes how it's done. Experience does this. It's reversible, by the way. So you can turn genes on and you can turn them off. Not exactly at will. The key thing here is that Lamarck was correct. You may remember that Lamarck had the idea that um, properties so learning and so on that you might have done could be passed on to your offspring. Now, people poo-pooed this and say this isn't uh, darwin -y at all. But in fact, Lamarck was correct that you can, in fact, pass on information from one generation to the next through the effect of epigenetics. So genes can be turned on in you, and that 
those genes that are turned on can now be passed on to your offspring. So experiences that you have, therefore, can affect your offspring's brains. Your offspring's brain, they only have one. Uh, offspring's brain. And I'll, I'll say a little more about that. So not all of Lamarck's ideas were correct, of course, but this particular one, the idea that you can transfer traits from one generation to the other with the same DNA, DNA is not changed. So Darwin's theory is based on DNA. This is a different system. So what this says here, if you could read over here, it says nature and it says nurture. And so the idea is you have genes, nature, and you have stimulation and nutrition. Nutrition is a kind of experience which are producing this epigenetic change, which ends up affecting a physical health, mental health, behavior, and learning and uh, cognitive uh, functions. This physical and mental health turns out to be important because what I'm going to tell you is experiences that you have prenatally can predict your health at age 60 years, which is actually quite amazing and it's a bit scary. Uh, for most of us, it's a little late. Uh, <laughs> we're there. One thing I have to say too, my wife always says, make sure that you don't blame the mums. So, <laughs> Since mine's dead, I can blame her for anything I want. Um, but I'm not, it's not just about moms, it's caregivers in general that are going to be uh, key here, not just moms, although moms obviously in the in utero part play a different role than your dad or other caregivers. All right, so this is, <laughs> pardon me, this is a, a brain, human brain. It has an enormous number of neurons, something in the order of 80 billion um, in adults, a lot more than that earlier on, and I'll say a little about that about 10 to the 14 connections. So you couldn't actually have a blueprint for a brain. It's impossible. You couldn't actually specify how this thing's going to look. What you have to do is much like what Michelangelo did when he made the Statue of David. What he did was to start with a big block of marble or whatever it was and some chisels and get rid of most of it. So you start out with overcapacity and get rid of stuff. That's what your brain does. You start out with more brain than you need you make more connections than you could possibly want, and you start getting rid of them. And chisels, the chisels are environmental experiences. They could be hormones, they could be drugs, it could be all kinds of things. But that's what's going to happen. So bigger is not better here. Bigger is worse in terms of brain. So if you have a small head and you say, well, my head's small, my brain must be small. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Big is not so good. Um, OK, so these are the stages of brain development. And so the brain, the cells are born. We have a, a nursery, I'll show you that. Then they migrate somewhere. Then they're gonna turn into somebody. It's just like your kids. You have your kids, they um, kind of grow in, into their body and into their mind. Then they, they leave, hooray. And <laughs> they, one thing that's different here is the migration of these cells. They continue to differentiate when they get to where they're going. And then they mature, they form synapses, and then you start getting rid of them. And this is gonna, this, is going to, this beginning to get rid of them is going to happen around one year to 18 months and continue for quite a while. Here's a nursery. So you've got the ventricles in the brain. And so this picture would be looking through like that. That nursery you still have. So you, as you're sitting here right now, I hope you're making neurons. Because uh, if you're not, you aren't going to remember a whole lot. Um, so those neurons will migrate. And so here there's little highways and they migrate up to the surface and they mature. Here is a newborn brain. Uh, here are cells at one month going, and they're getting more complicated. This is in the frontal lobe, up to 24 months. This um, is the maximum complexity they're going to show is at about 24 months. So what happens here? We've got two lines. If you can see colors, this is, I'm gonna call this purple with, um, Deference to all the women who are going to have some other name for it that men wouldn't know. At any rate, there's that. This is the occipital lobe. So we see a peak here. This is number of connections, number of synapses. A peak about one year. It levels off briefly for about a year, and then you start losing them. And you can see the number of synapses is dropping. And it's dropping because you're getting rid of cells, and you're getting rid of connections. The frontal lobe is later. So at birth, it's still got a long ways to go. It reaches its peak at two years. It sits there for about seven years, and then it starts to drop. Puberty is when you have the maximum loss of synapses in the frontal lobe, 
And the rate of loss is actually rather quite profound. It's about 200,000 connections per second that you're losing. So anyone who's been around 12 to 14-year-old girls understands <laughs> the importance of losing those 200,000 synapses per second. It's the only reason in the morning you're still willing to have them in the house because they've changed overnight. <laughs> They're better. So what have you got? You've got this early time in here when you're growing the brain. That's a profound time in terms of, of uh, later behavior. And then you've got this time as you get out here where you're reshaping the brain. This reshaping will continue um, in males probably to about age 30 years, in females probably age 25. So if I asked you, those of you who are over 30, which looking around is likely just about everyone, said, when did you become who you are now? It's not going to be at 21. I think most of us would not want to be the person we were at 21, as cool as we were at the time. <laughs> Um, it's a different person now, right? So for me, it's probably my early 30s. And I'm the same person now as I was then. For women, it's probably a little earlier, maybe 28, 27, something like that. What's that reflecting? It's reflecting the fact that the brain changes are decelerating. You're not seeing the same rate of synaptic loss that you saw earlier. So it continues for um, 20 to 25, and someday to say as long as 35. My wife says in men, it's probably 50. Um, but I'm past that, so I guess it's there. Now, here's one of the counterintuitive things. If you're losing all these connections in the brain, then what ought to be happening is you could actually see the brain getting smaller. That should be true, right? And if you look at the cortex, the outer stuff, you can actually see that. So here's the experiments that have been done at the National Institute of Health in the U.S. You, take, you can take newborn babies and throw them in an MRI, feed them and throw them in there and they'll go to sleep. But you can't take two-year-olds and say, I want you to lie still for half an hour. <laughs> but you can bribe five-year-olds. So this is a five-year-old, and this is going from five to 20. Now, the greener that, and the um, hotter the color, so red, yellow, green, the thicker the cortex. The bluer the color, the thinner the cortex. So if you look, this is looking down from the top. And this is going to be around age eight or so. You can see that the frontal lobe is thicker than the back part of the brain. And what's happening with, with aging, aging up to 20, is that it's getting bluer and bluer. So what's happening is your cortex is getting thinner as you get older. And I'm telling you, this is a good thing. If it fails to do that, you can have various forms of uh, retardation. OK, so here's an example of this counterintuitiveness. So this is looking um, at places in the brain where the thinner the cortex is, the better your verbal skills are. Are you with me? So it's an inverse correlation. So as, your, as these regions get thinner, your verbal fluency is going up. So the people who have the highest verbal fluency are going to have the thinnest regions there. What's that reflecting? More efficiency, I suppose. It's a fact. I don't think I showed it in here. No. Um, but if you look at um, motor skills and you looked up in here at the uh, hand area, what you'd find is that your finger dexterity is inversely correlated with the thickness of that cortex. So it gets thinner and thinner, and your finger dexterity is getting better. So getting rid of all these connections is beneficial. Now think about it as teachers. What are we doing? As, as teachers or educators in general, we're actually acting as ways of making the kids' brains smaller. It's a different way of thinking about it. But there's more to it than that. So there's two features here. So what I've talked about is called experience expected plasticity. So the brain is expecting certain kinds of experiences. It's going to, it's going to be expecting to hear a language. And if the language you hear is Japanese, and not English, then the brain is going to get rid of some of the cells in the brain that are not necessary for Japanese. What happens now as an adult when you learn English? Well, you have a problem, for example, in making discrimination between L and R. We had a, a Korean, Koreans were the same, had a Korean technician uh, when I was a graduate student, and she would go around putting signs and everything, so we had a bloom closet. And she actually wrote them that way. And of course, it was a great delight to all the graduate students. 
how can she be so stupid? Well, it's because she threw away those, those cells. She didn't need them. And so uh, now when she needs them, she hasn't got them. So that's experience expectant plasticity. There's also experience dependent plasticity, and that is if you're going to learn anything, if you remember anything that I say today, we have to rewire your brain. Memory is based upon connectivity. So all memories reflect changes in, in, in connectivity in the brain. That can actually mean you're going to see an increase in the number of connections. But it's a small increase, and it could actually reflect an increase somewhere and a decrease somewhere else. So just think about this. You've got this brain. It's too big. You're, you're getting it down by about a half. And then you start playing with it and changing the circuits that are in there in order to lay down memories and to think. And if you think about it, if you have a thought that tomorrow you can remember, it means that your thought rewired your brain. So that's experience-dependent plasticity. There's two different kinds of plastic changes in the brain. One that's developmental and one that's not. It's there all the time. Okay, here's a little bit of science. A few examples of uh, factors that can change uh, brain development. The earliest studies were done at McGill University uh, in the 1940s by uh, Donald Hebb. And what Hebb did was to take lab rats home. Not legal in Alberta to do that. <laughs> but he took them home and let them loose in the house. His wife wasn't so keen on this, and so she would try and keep them in the kitchen. She had it all boarded up, and she would chase them around the house with a broom to hear him tell it. Mm -hmm. But they had a stimulating environment. He then took those rats back to the lab and compared them to rats on various intelligence tests that he, he invented, compared them to rats that um, did not have that experience. And I think you can see here, here's a neuron from a lab-housed animal. Here's one from the... Um, in, we have what we call rat condominiums, so they live in these complex environments. Uh, and you can see, I hope, that this one is more complicated than that one. Now, we don't just sort of sit around and look in the microscope and say, that ah, looks a little more complicated. We actually can, can uh, measure it. I'm just not going to bore you with how we do that, because it's boring. Uh, but you can measure it. So what you see is that if you put animals postnatally in these complex environments, you get bigger cells. Um, what if you put dads in these, so the experiments that Robin Gibb and Rochelle Marchesiak have done uh, are really fun. So what, what they've done is to say, okay, let's put dads in these complex experiences, complex environments, sorry, and then take them out, and then the dad meets your mom, and then you're born, you've never been in there. What does that, what happens? Well, your brain looks like you were. So your dad having been in there changes your brain. Same with the mum. You can put the mum in there, and the mum having been in there changes the brain. Now, how is this possible? You can see how the mum could maybe do it. How can the dad's experience in there change your brain? Ah, think about it. Sperm, in contrast to egg cells, sperm is being turned over every couple months. So the epigenetics of the cells in the sperm is being changed by the experiences the dad is having at the time the cells are being born. You with me? So we've got, you've got the sperm. Some of you have the sperm. Um, and, <laughs> and it's being changed uh, by experiences. So the DNA expression, sorry, the gene expression, the DNA is not changing. The gene expression is changing. So now what you can do is you can give the dad experiences and the brains of the offspring are changed as a result of this. And so along with Olga and her group in um, uh, Hepler Hall, We've been doing uh, gene methylation studies and being able to show that the expression of genes, this whole metaphor I had, the expression of genes is being changed by prenatal, in this case preconceptual, not prenatal, but preconceptual pre experiences. I was at a meeting um, and mentioned this, and this geneticist got up and he says, stop right there, don't say anything more, this is the most important thing you'll ever find, study that. And I said, you're a geneticist, you study that. I, I study other things. <laughs> Just gave you something to work on. Um, so we have larger brains, and I've told you that larger is not as good, larger in the sense that there are more connections, um, and the animals have enhanced cognitive and motor behaviors. Well, we can get to the brain through the skin. I was at a, a presentation in Israel years ago, and this woman was talking about if you took premature babies, and they're in an incubator, and you tactily stimulated them three times a day for 15 minutes with a little brush, they grew faster, and they were discharged from the hospital sooner. And I thought, hold on. Rats are like premature infants. 
So we, maybe we can make the brains grow faster and better by using a little brush. So we initially used a histology brush. We now use a Swifter. Um, <laughs> we do more than one. And basically, line the rats up like little Vienna sausages and just <laughs> And I don't do it. People like these people do it. Um, I'm way too allergic to spend a lot of time doing that. But anyway, what happens is, if you just do this for 10 days, three times a day, and then you look in the brains of adults or look at the behavior, the behavior's different. The animals are smarter, they have better motor skills, the whole connect connectivity pattern has been altered by this. Well, Robin had the idea, what if you just tactically stimulated the mum? And I said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. That would never work. I'm telling it was my idea because it works. Um, so it was not quite as gruesome as this, but we used a child's hairbrush. You, you, you tactically stimulate the pregnant mom. Um, they don't actually like it very much at first, so you have to bribe them with treats. Once they realize treats, like cheesies, come along with the brushing, got it. Um, the controls just get the cheesies. Same thing, we can change the wiring diagram. The animals have better motor skills, have better cognitive skills as adults. Do you have to touch them? So we had this idea that in Europe, people use uh, broad spectrum light to treat burns. And so maybe if we just use this broad spectrum light, it wouldn't work here because there's fur in the way, but it would work here because there isn't any. So if we use this broad spectrum light, could we actually change the brain of the babies? And the answer is yes, you can. What does that mean? It means there's something in the skin that's being turned on by that experience, whether it's the light, Incidentally, the, the touch is more effective, but the light does work. Um, and that's something, one of those things at least, is something called fibroblast growth factor 2, FGF2. FGF2 is changed by tactile stimulation, it's changed by lots of things. FGF2, if you think back to your high school biology, if you took it, um, one of the things that you learned was that the uh, brain and skin, the, the nervous system and skin come from the same germ cell there. So they respond to a lot of the same experiences. So FGF2 is produced by the skin. If you hurt your skin, you cut yourself, you rub it like that, and you start producing more FGF2. FGF2 has receptors in the brain as well. And so you can actually do this and change your brain. So tactile stimulation is really important. And if you look at maternal massage, it's quite common. And your women do a lot of this all the time, right? They're actually stimulating the baby's brain by producing FGF2 in their own skin, goes into the blood, crosses the placental barrier. Uh, obviously, she's got lots of tactile stimulation. We have tactile stimulation here. Now, what I'm going to tell you, and this is a, a problem for educators, is that tactile stimulation, not only of infants, but of children, is really important. Of course, we're not allowed to have tactile stimulation with kids in school anymore, but there's a little bit of a message there, but it's clear that in some South American countries, um, tactile stimulation with babies is seen as central to their normal development. And I read this article recently of somebody in East Africa who had uh, imported baby carriages from England, and they had this store that sold baby carriages, and they were going out of business. And so this person went in the store and said, well, why are you going out of business? I see babies everywhere. And they said, yeah, but the mothers don't understand why you'd have a carriage. You just carry them, and it's the cuddling and the stimulation that's really important, and you put them in, in the buggy, and they don't get that. That turns out to be true. And, it, and it's affecting brain. Okay. So what's the effect? You get a larger brain, more connections. It's the same thing. You get changes in gene expression, uh, and so on. Hormones. Now, hormones are amazing chisels. In utero, males are exposed to testosterone and females are not. And then, obviously, during puberty, uh, both sexes are exposed to different sets of hormones. So when I first started teaching here um, 36 years ago, and I would say things like, we're going to now talk about the effects of sex hormones on the brain, the feminists were really unhappy. And the reason they were unhappy is because what they heard me say was, men's brains are better than women's. Of course I was saying that. I'm a man. Um, but that's not what I said. I said the, the hormones are changing brain. And people now are a lot more re receptive to the idea. It's obvious that there are receptors in the genitals, and those, those receptors uh, respond to testosterone. So the female state is the default state. If you add testosterone, you get different genitals. Those same receptors are in the brain. So why wouldn't they affect the brain too? Why wouldn't the brains of men and women 
boys and girls be different, and they are, um, right from the get-go, as soon as you start producing these hormones in utero. This illustrates, um, just imagine the frontal lobe goes a little further here. So this is the left hemisphere, we're looking at it at the side. Rip off the left one, and now you can see the inside of the right hemisphere here, okay? This is a challenge for some people's parietal lobes to get that. It's there, now I can see that one. So, the ones that are blue, males' brains are bigger than females' brains, on average, and the reason is that brain size is related to body size. So whales have bigger brains than we do. Um, so males, because they're on the whole bigger than females, the brain is slightly larger, and within each sex, the, re the re uh, relationship holds. The taller you are, the bigger the brain's going to be. So we have to collapse and correct for, for body size, and, and when we do that, what we can see is that there are regions of the female brain that are relatively larger. So the blue areas are relative, re reflect regions that are relatively larger. So this region up here of the frontal lobe is relatively larger in women than in men. And unfortunately, a lot of this is cut off, but the stuff behind your eyes and, and the bottom part of the frontal lobe, the, the gray part there, is relatively larger in men than in women. There's a little story here. Some of you have heard this, but we, this comes from one of our books, and I sent the art in. I said to the artist, I want you to make the regions that are bigger in females pink and the regions that are bigger in males blue. And her response was, that's sexist. <laughs> but everybody understands it. Um, so blue is girls uh, in this case. <laughs> so of course the brains are going to um, function differently. And we can see uh, um, lots of examples. Now if we look at um, brain size and brain development, there's a couple things here. In this case, it's correct. Well, in my view, it's correct. That is, blue is boys and pink is girls. So this is total brain volume. You can see that the girls are peaking at around age 11, and then it's getting smaller. The boys are peaking around age 15. What's that tell you? The brain is four years younger in boys than in girls. It's that much slower. If you look at gray volume, which is the number of, of neurons, you can see the same thing. It's not quite as big a difference. Girls reach their peak around 9. Remember, they're getting rid of cells and connections. And boys reach their peak around 11. Never mind this. If you look at white volume, which is the uh, amount of connections and the uh, amount of, and represents also the amount of myelin or, or insulation on the, on the connections, you can see at age 19, neither males nor females have asymptoted. Females look like they're close. Males are clearly going up. So the message here, prolonged development, huge sex differences. So it's no surprise that there are huge sex differences in behavior. So if we look at uh, task-favoring women, and notice he cleverly put those ones on before the tasks-favoring men, not to have any misunderstanding. Women are better at, at computational skills. They're way better at uh, recall of stories and verbal stories and so on. And my PhD advisor said to me one day, Brian, you know why it's always best to tell the truth? I said, I can think of reasons, but why do you think? And he says, because you can always remember what you said. <laughs> so males, given that uh, females are better at recalling stories than we are, it's best to tell the truth because you're going to get um, hoisted on your own petard there. And they're, they're better at other things as well. Uh, remembering the, the location of objects, a key chosen uh, there for a reason than males. Males, however, are better at mathematical skills. They're better at geometric patterning and, and doing um, geographical knowledge and so on. The one that's curious is that males are better at throwing projectiles, and you might think that's an experiential thing, and it's not. That it can be seen right away in young chimpanzees. So the males are better and more accurate at throwing rocks than females, even though they haven't done any more of it. So there's some advantage that males have in um, throwing projectiles, which if you think about our origins, makes some sense probably. Okay, drugs. What we've been able to discover, we've been doing this for almost 20 years now, is that if you take any psychoactive drug, and unfortunately I get to include caffeine in that, it leaves a footprint on your brain forever. Now, if taking it once doesn't do it. And if you think about it, the reason we take psychoactive drugs is to change our brain, so we shouldn't be so surprised. I think what's surprising is that the effects are so big and so prolonged. But we've been able to show, and of course prescription drugs are in that category, 
just examples. These are psychomotor stimulants, nicotine, caffeine, cocaine, antidepressants, so SSRIs, uh, anxiolytics like Valium and Librium, uh, marijuana, morphine, antipsychotics, and more. And if you simply look, this is an example of a cell from here. If you were a human, it would be here. If you're a rat, it's right here. Same region of the brain. And I hope you can see visually the amphetamine-treated brain is, has more complicated cells than the saline-treated brain, and that persists. So uh, in the case of a rat, if you looked um, six months later, which is a quarter of their lifespan, those changes haven't gone away. And that's with a very small number of um, administrations. Is this bad or good? Yes. It's just a thing. Right? These drugs are changing the brain. We have to recognize that. And it turns out that the age at which you're exposed to the drugs makes a huge difference. And guess when the worst time is? Puberty. Because it's not changing the brain in the same way as it does in us. So this drug, taken by anyone in this room today, is going to have pretty innocuous effects relative to a 13-year-old taking this drug. So the footprint of each drug class is unique. So it's stimulants are different than opiates or different than antidepressants, which are different than antipsychotics. But the frontal lobe is always changed. It's the only region that always shows drug-related changes, which is interesting and presumably reflects um, the importance of understanding since frontal lobe function, I am a frontal lobe chauvinist, the fr frontal lobe functioning drives everything. Uh, we really need to understand how to reverse these things if possible. A lot of these things have prenatal effects, and we're uh, looking now at the effects, for example, of exposure to nicotine prenatally. So your mom is given, your mom doesn't smoke, we just give her nicotine. Um, and we, we can see changes in the development of your brain and your behavior as an adult. So all of these drugs have those effects. And I, I was giving a talk to a, at a psychiatry meeting and said, you know, that one of the most profound set of changes comes from fluoxetine, which is Prozac. I said, giving Prozac to pregnant moms is a bad idea. And this uh, psychiatrist got really uh, angry at me and said, well, hold on here. Which is worse, infanticide or some minor changes in brain development in your kids? Well, the question you really want to ask is, if you don't need to be on the Prozac, don't be on it. And she said, well, a lot of women when they're uh, pregnant are anxious, and so we give it to when they're anxious. Of course they're anxious. You're having a baby, for God's sake. There's no reason to be giving drugs that are going to change the baby's brain. <coughs> if, in fact, the mom needs the medication for other reasons, great. But I think we have to really be cautious about some of these things. And, of course, the drugs that you're exposed to early change the way you learn later. And this just gives an example. So we've seen this with um, a variety of drugs, but we did studies in which we gave juvenile animals uh, Ritalin and then took them off the Ritalin and then as adults tested their cognitive skills and saw impairments. So what we, would, we had done was we made the brain less plastic. Now, does this mean we shouldn't give Ritalin to uh, ADHD kids? No. It means we better make sure they're really ADHD uh, kids because the ADHD brain is somewhat different. And so these things you begin to look at it and say, wow, we're, we're having a big effect on these kids' brains. Parent-child relationships are profound. No surprise to parents. And all mammals uh, have parent-child relationships. The one group that's a little odd is bunnies. Bunnies don't spend a lot of time uh, with their infants, but all of their mammals do. And it has to do with bunnies going off and feeding and coming back. But the difference in the amount of time that a really attentive mom, whether she's human or orang or rat, spends with their infants, if we look at the normal curve, is about six hours a day. So we've got a six-hour difference. And that turns out to have a profound effect. Remember the tactile stimulation story? We start there. Here's what I'm calling a natural experiment. So you may remember that when um, the, the wall came down in Europe and <coughs> Romania was dis, uh, discovered to have all these orphanages and Tuchesco was uh, strung up and so on, that these orphans were adopted to Canada, the US, Australia, and whatnot. And then we get a lot from other uh, countries as well. Why did we have this problem? Well, it turned out that the communists believe that in order to have a more productive state, you needed to have more kids. So they set up what was called the menstrual police. And you had to report every month to the menstrual police because you were required to have five children. And so if you were on any kind of birth control or if you were pregnant, this had to be determined. And I have a friend who's a geologist in Calgary and said, yeah, she went every month to the menstrual police. And so all's great, we're all going to have all these kids now, but of course the state didn't give you money to look after them, 
So the state had an idea, we'll just build orphanages and put the kids in the orphanages, which is what they did. And this turned into a natural, uh, national sorry, uh, disaster. So the caregiver to child ratio was 1 to 25 to, or 30. Oh, how much, how much caregiving did they get? How much tactile stimulation did they get? None. So here's just, a, you've seen these kind of pictures. Okay, so what happens when these kids are adopted out to Canada or the US or the UK? They don't do very well. In fact, they do really poorly. Some of these kids are in their 20s now. They've never recovered. So it turns out that if you're adopted after somewhere between 6 and 12 months, you're hooped. You've got to be adopted before that uh, in order for you to make it. What you see is small brains. The metabolic activity is abnormal. There's about a 20 uh, point IQ hit in these kids. So you get this two year old that you've adopted and nothing you can do is going to reverse these effects. We see a lot of vulnerability to behavioral problems, a lot of um, ADHD kinds of things, aggressive behaviors and so on. It doesn't matter which country they go to, the effect was the same. I have a friend who's at Harvard, his name is Chuck Nelson, and he did the following experiment, and you can question the morality of the experiment, and, and um, I won't right now. But he said maybe it's because they were taken to a different culture. So what he did was he went in and he said, okay, you stay in the institution, you go to home in Bucharest. You stay in the institution, you go to home in Bucharest. And so, and, and Again, the age was controlled here. They knew the age of the kids. And, it, and they paid the families in Bucharest the equivalent of an average person's salary in order to have a caregiver there 24-7. Okay, so it didn't have to be the mom. It could be a grandma or an aunt or whatever. What was the result? Exactly the same. It didn't matter whether they were in Bucharest or New York City. The effect was the same. Well, there's obviously some of this going on. So what about stress? And, I'm not going to get into stress in detail here because stress uh, has a lot of effects. But the, the simplest thing, if you look at an animal that's had prenatal stress, this is a, a um, region of one of the dendrites in the brain, and this is the control. I hope you can see this is simpler than that. So it's simple to a fault. And what you see in these animals is you see um, smaller brains, uh, larger adrenal glands, which Celeste discovered. Um, altered prefrontal development, fewer synapses, and both cognitive and motor deficits. So what? Well, we've changed the structure of prefrontal regions, which means they're going to function differently. And that means they're going to respond to other experiences differently. So if you have this prenatal stress, and then everything's pretty good in your development, now you get to high school, we're going to expect the brain not to respond the same way as it would have had you not had that prenatal stress. Is it, are the effects reversible? Yeah, probably not. Peer relationships, well, this is critical. So some of you may know that Sergio Pellis uh, in our place is arguably the world's expert on play behavior. He studied uh, close to 60 species of primates as well as tons of rodents and people and so on. Play behavior is really important. It's a form of problem solving. So here's two rats. They're playing. And they play the same as kittens. So this, this guy is trying to get around and nuzzle the knee of that guy. The guy on the bottom is going to go, no, you don't. And so you'll start to see, you know, you've seen kittens and there's sort of this popcorn thing, they zoom around. Rats do the same thing. There are rules, however, and that is I get to try you and then you get to try me. If you don't play by the rules, nobody will play with you. Um, there are other rules as well, and the details don't matter, but there are rules, and all the animals know those rules, or no one will play with them. Well, if we look at, uh, these are two species of macaques. So these are Tonkin macaques, and these are Japanese macaques. If you know anything about macaques, they're, they're genetically almost identical, but these guys are real bastards. And these guys are kind of laid back, like, life's cool, let's just sit here and, on the Tonkin Islands and hang out. Well, what's caused that? The play behavior and the two groups is totally different. Play behavior here is almost all, always dyads. So uh, let's suppose that Mary and I are going to be playing, and um, I can easily bully her, and I can, I can say, you're going to do it my way, right? <laughs> I'm bigger, I'm up above you. And so that's what happens in, in adulthood. They bully one another, and you've got a very structured society uh, in which there's a lot of tension and aggression. These always play in groups. 
this is a bit more of a problem. Because if we've got this, this group of six people here, and I go to bully Miriam, Celeste may say, oh, no, you don't. She's my friend. And so now what you've got to do is to realize the dynamics of the whole thing. And what happens is the play behavior is nowhere near as rough, and you don't see this uh, structured society. So what's happening is that somehow this early play behavior is changing brain development. So we were able to manipulate that, and I won't give you the details on rats, and it does. So the amount of play affects the complexity of cells in the frontal lobe. Not only that, the amount of play um, predicts the plasticity of the brain later. So if you're not allowed to play during development, your brain becomes very inflexible as an adult. It's not responding to all these experiences in the same way. Well, that's pretty neat, because what's that tell you? The function of play is to make the brain changeable later. And that's the hypothesis we're running with. So I want you to think about disorders in which play is affected. Autism, ADHD, blah, 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 right? And so what's that doing? What about, this is really not PC, but what about homeschool kids? Are they getting the appropriate amount of play behavior? What about the importance of recess and so on? What about, and I've been reading all this stuff, and I'm just stunned that there are schools now in Ontario where kids aren't allowed to run at recess. They have to walk or they get detentions and whatnot. Come on. We're trying to change the brain here. And they're not, you're not going to be doing it. So this just says what I said here. Diet. Does diet make a difference? Of course. I don't think that's a surprise. Um, Bonnie Kaplan at the University of Calgary uh, has this paper, and it says, is prenatal microtrut... You could read it. Um, important, and the answer is yes. And this is a review paper. It's really quite good. She's been studying uh, nutrition and, and brain development for a long time, as have we. Okay, now we're going to change topics just a bit here and say, okay, we've got early brain development. Educators are interested in literacy. Society demands literate people. What's the relationship? This is a neat study. Um, this is a, a newborn baby who has this cap on her head. So this baby's a few hours old, has this cap, and on the cap, in the cap, there are these uh, detectors. And so what we can do is we can shine light through the skull and the hemoglobin in the blood will absorb the light, and then the light comes back out, so the red ones are the light, and the blue ones are the detector. Why would you want to do that? Because when you're doing things, so right now, as you're listening to me, the regions of your brain required to understand what I'm saying are stealing all the blood. The regions of the brain that tell you how, tells you how your feet feel don't get much until I mention it, and you say, oh, I can feel my feet. The blood just got shunted somewhere else. So, you, you know, there's this myth, and I'll come back to this, that you only use 10% of your brain. That's true at any given minute, any given second, because there isn't enough blood. So the blood's being shunted around from one place to another. So what's happening here? If we shine a light and not much uh, light comes back out, there must have been a lot of hemoglobin there stealing the light. So now what we can do is we can actually see what this baby's brain is doing when it's an hour old. And so this neat study by Janet Worker at the University of British Columbia, what she did was to say, let's take babies at an hour old and see whether or not they can recognize the language that their parents were speaking while they were in utero. You with me? So in Miriam's case, it would be not English. It would be, is it Georgian? Georgian. Is that the language? Yeah. yeah. She's from Georgia. Not the one south, the one, yeah. Um, so it would be Georgian, and if we played English to her, the brain's paying no attention. If we play Georgian to her, the brain goes, wow, that's my language. So the question we begin to realize here is that there's stuff being picked up in utero that's going to affect language development. So the question I put on here, um, how does this affect language learning? And is there an effect of the amount of language exposure on later language learning. In other words, if you're in a household that doesn't have a lot of language being spoken, people are not very verbal, what impact is that going to have? Well, let's see. What we're going to do here is we're going to look at vocabulary in children. And we've broken them into, not we, the people who did the study, um, Hart and Risley, um, broke them into three groups. One that at age 36 months have low vocabulary, one that has a middle level and one that has a high level. And you can see this turns out to be four times higher than that. And notice I have in brackets SES because it correlates with socioeconomic status. 
So what you've got is the kids in low SES families having uh, lower vocabulary. What you can do is you can go in and just have a tape recorder and have it um, playing randomly in the homes once you discover that there's no language being spoken. There's language on the television, but there's no language being spoken to the kids. So it turns out, and I hate this metaphor, but I'll use it anyway, it has to be serve and return. I say something to you, and I'm expecting something back. TV doesn't work. What's even more interesting is if you look at these kids at age 10, these kids at age 10 have a higher vocabulary than the mums of these kids at age 10. So what we're seeing is that the language exposure, and I think it's going to include prenatal exposure, the language exposure is affecting how these kids are going to do in school and subsequently in life. There's a study in New Zealand that is really scary for educators, I think, and that is they compared, they took five-year-old kids and gave them tests of math and reading, and they put them in two groups, the, the top uh, quartile and the bottom quartile, and what they found was that if they looked at age 14, the kids were in the same quartiles. So kids who were in the bottom quartile at age five are in the bottom quartile at age 14, regardless of how much schooling they had and vice versa. What this tells us is that there's little change in school outcomes after age five on these literacy things. So as teachers, we're going, hold on here. What do you mean? Well, those are the data. Similar studies are being done in British Columbia now by Clyde Hertzman, and the results are the same. That is, you can predict literacy at eight when the kids get to school. So we have to figure out as educators some way of turning the clock back. We've got to somehow figure out how we can reverse some of these brain changes and make the brain more responsive to language. The OECD has this uh, literacy definition, the capacity to identify, understand, interpret, create, and communicate knowledge using written materials. And they have a test of literacy, and there are five levels of literacy. So if you look in the United States, levels one and two are low, so these people would have trouble following instructions on the, on the back of a pill bottle, prescription bottle. Notice that you can't, but this is roughly half the population of the United States. And then these are higher levels. So these are people who are, are doing fairly well. And level four would be most of the kids we have in university. And with luck, most of us are here, and there's not very many of us. Well, you can look at literacy level and predict health in middle age. This is health problems, and these are the kinds of health problems. And you can see the higher the literacy, the less likely you are to have health problems in middle age. And there are other studies that have looked at uh, early stressors, uh, early aversive experiences, and can show exactly the same thing. Cuba. I promised you that I told Fraser I would talk about Cuba. Not because Fraser uh, was a communist, but because Cuba is an outlier. And he's an outlier relative, and you'll see even relevant, uh, relative to Canada. So Castro actually believed that children were important, and he set up these uh, poly clinics. So what happens in, in Cuba is that as soon as you're pregnant and you've seen your doctor, you now have to go to that doctor uh, monthly until the baby's born, and then they have the clinics. The clinics are in the schools. So the, the moms go to the schools, and the kids are in the schools, and they've got to go back monthly to the schools. And in fact, they go back more than that. And they have um, a kind of um, pre-education system, so early educational system, that's not a parking lot for like a day daycare. Actually, things are going on. The moms go there. Things are happening. And you have to go um, every month at least. And if you don't, they come looking for you and say, why aren't you there? And make sure that you come. So you've got these uh, polyclinics, and you've got pre- and postnatal health. You've got nutritional support, child care stimulation, which is what I was saying, and these weekly home visits I didn't mention of a public health nurse until these kids get to school. So this is the, the system they have. And so UNESCO has done studies, one here and one here, looking at um, countries all over the world. And the key ones for this uh, are, is Latin America. So if you look at Grade three language scores, here's the mean. This is Mexico, Cuba, Chile, Brazil, and Argentina. Cuba's an outlier. Where is Canada? We're not this high. In fact, there have been some neat studies done 
in uh, North Carolina and in Mexico taking the Cuban system with disadvantaged people and the one in Mexico is really neat, they simply took it whole, uh, whole hog, took the whole system and they look just like this and their average scores are higher than the Canadian average. So we don't, can't be too smug on this that the, the point here is that this, these early experiences are changing brain development and that's changing how these kids are going to do in school. So why is neuroscience important in education? Well, I hope I've given you a little bit um, a flavor. We need to understand brain development. But we also need to help debunk myths. So one myth I mentioned was the 10% myth, the idea you only use 10% of your brain, and that's, of course, crazy. If you lost 5% of your brain, we'd all know it pretty quickly. <laughs> so there's something wrong there, isn't there? Um, this whole left brain, right brain thing is interesting, but you have to know where it came from. The idea of left brain, right brain came from uh, World War II veterans with bullet wounds. Oh, when you hear that, you say, well, does that mean it's not true? No, it's true. The two sides are doing different things, but, oops, how did I do that? But they're doing different things in a way that's not like the pop psychology of the 70s and 80s suggested, and we know this has sort of lost its pizzazz now. Vaccines cause autism, not true. Um, Brain development is done by age three. No, it's not done by age three. Where did this come from? It came from the Clintons. So the Clintons actually in the U.S. pushed the idea, not the Simpsons, the Clintons. <laughs> the Clintons pushed the idea that no child left behind and so on, pour money into those first two to three years and then don't worry about the later years. Did you catch the part about puberty and the brain changing and all that? Yeah. Yes, this is important, but it's not the only time. We have, it's clearly a really important time, and Fraser says, oh, all that other stuff is poo-poo. If, if you haven't done it here, it doesn't matter what you do later. There's some truth to that, but it's not all done by age three. It, these things are reversible. Girls and boys are the same. No, they're not, and so on. We can provide knowledge about brain development and function. We've learned, I think, in the last decade more about brain development than we ever imagined could be known, and the, the, I, I've only given you sort of a... a a quick view of it, but the, the effective experiences of brain development is just really stunning. And the implications for education are obvious. We can provide informed solutions to practical issues. So for example, uh, this says testing not only measures knowledge, but it strengthens it. So there have been a lot of studies done now showing that if kids are not tested, their memory of things is not as good as if they are tested. So testing is important. I don't think we need to go overboard, but it has a role. And you know that with your university students. You know that with yourself. If you, go to this, you come to this lecture and you're not being tested on this material, your recall is not going to be as good as if you know that you're going to have to re repeat it at some later time. I mean, I'm probably the worst at that. I have to take notes and I have to review them or I'll forget everything. And it's not because I have gray hair. Um, we now know that early music training enhances verbal and nonverbal skills. And in fact, it increases IQ about seven points on average if you have early music training that is beginning by age six or so. Huge impact. So should we have music training in schools? Duh. Uh, exercises enhance brain development and learning. Uh, exercise and, and play I could have put in there as well. Uh, stress determines learning, sorry, stress undermines learning and alters brain structure. So the stress, both prenatal stress and then childhood stress there's good stress and bad stress, right? So we have an inverted U. You need some where you'll be asleep. Um, but over-the-top stress is having a huge impact on brain structure and subsequently on learning. Proper sleep cycles. This is an interesting one. Proper sleep cycles influence brain development. So people have been looking at, of course, when do we start high school? 8 a.m.? I can recall trying to get my kids up, and it was these zombies leaving the house. <laughs> you think, maybe if... Somehow we could accommodate the sleep-waking cycle somehow. Uh, we might do better. So, literacy in developing years predicts later health and wellness. It not only includes learning, but being able to use language to explain concepts. So what we need is not, we need this serve and return. We need this interaction with the words, not just hearing the words. You actually have to use them to do something. If you don't use them, it's really not having much impact on you. These are supposed to be, it should say conclusions, I'm not sure why I have examples, but these are points here. Learning needs to be a serve and return strategy. It's not a passive process. 
So conclusions. Pre and postnatal experience alter development. Development's prolonged and it's influenced by an amazing array of experiences. And I think that we're just beginning to understand that virtually every experience we have has a long-term consequence, just like every drug. And finally, neuroscience is starting to unravel the principles of brain development. And I think that uh, the principles are going to have huge um, uh, implications for public policy, especially those related to education and obviously health. <coughs> I didn't focus on health. But it's obvious that what's happened in the last three or four years, and Rick and I were talking about this, is a change in mindset that now we're being asked to give all kinds of workshops to the government, to the Department of Education. So we put on Brain 101 last year, a full day workshop, uh, we being Robin Gibb, and Sergio Pellis and I, they want us back this year for Brain 201. So another full day workshop and the idea is a four year um, cycle and that the, all the educators would be, all the educators, whatever that means. People in the Department of Education would come to these. I went up to Lac La Biche and, and which is in the middle of nowhere. It's Northern Lights, if you know where that is. It's a long ways up. For their PD day just before school started in September. And the night before, they said, we have, you have to give a presentation to the public. And I thought, who's going to come? Who would care about all of this? It was packed. About half the audience were natives. And I thought, oh, this isn't going to go down well. Because uh, I'm going to tell them about all the things that aren't done right in, in development in the brain. And that they were incensed that no one had told them this. Why haven't we been told this? And of course, right away, is this related to residential schools? Yes, it is, and so on. And so I think that what's happening is that there's now a hunger for this kind of information that wasn't there. And when Jane and I first spoke five years ago, maybe, about this idea of somehow getting neuroscience and education together, um, it was a really far-looking concept and a novel one. And I think it's, it's coming to pass. I think I've got Nancy's picture now. Uh, to finish off here. So we've started this program, and I think other places are going to be doing it too. And I'll stop there, and if there's questions, or you just want to drink wine, either one. Thanks. <laughs>